<laughs> How's it going, man? Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate hey, it. Any, so. Anytime a friend asked me to do something like this and somebody like you who we're, we're two brats growing up at the same racetrack together. So this isn't an interview. This is just a two old homies uh bench racing out, man bench racing that's so, it i've so. loved you you know as a brother since uh the early days man since since we were brats running around at riverhead so been a while well yeah. i mean <laughs> hell uh, uh you know I'm i wouldn't even yeah i am yeah. uh well hell i wouldn't even have a a, a shot in this business had not been for you walking in the the booth at thompson god yeah. that was what to 90 98 or 99 i remember I shooting think. pool with you at a bar in Huntington Station and you talking about how you wish you could come down here. And I think I think Bob and I or something talked to Mark Smith, maybe? I think or so. Pete Richards or something? Well, I came over and showed you my college tape of yeah. a, a little feature I produced to my plus brother. I heard you announce it like... Uh, Thompson. Medford, plus Medford 112. Oh, the go-kart, go-kart track. track. Yeah, the original, yeah. yeah. Me- plus, Medford I knew your Raceway. work ethic. It's like once you got in the business, that's all you needed was a, sh- a shot to get in the business. Your work ethic would take you places. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it has. It's taken me places. Uh, you know, to right so, here, you poor thing. To, you got to interview to, to me. Right here, <laughs> 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 Career comes full circle, I guess, oh, right? Oh, crap. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, but, you know, now you're a big time producer with Dale Jr. and, you know, doing, you've got your uh, Lost Speedway show that Thank came you. out, which was really cool. That I got to tell you, man. It's my dream. You, you know, I, exactly. And that was when I watched that show for the first time, I, I did get a little bit choked up and a little tear came to my eye Thank because you. I knew. I know how hard it is to make a show and to get it off the ground and to even just get it to get it on screen. Yeah. You know, there's presentations and proposals and just budgets and and nine times out of ten, it doesn't happen. No. You know, because that show almost didn't happen. I believe it. But to see, you know, what you what you did with Lost Speedways, just from something that started off as like pictures posted on a Facebook page, <laughs> turning it into a television show was incredible. Like Bobby Marcos, who's with me on the show, right? Like, mm-hmm. so I got some homies. It's like Bobby Marcos and Kyle Rizak, who's a figure eight racer. You'd love that from Canada. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, I remember one time hanging out with Bobby in Indianapolis and telling him, he tells the story great, how I was like, hey man, one day I want to make this into a TV show. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, Okay, <laughs> sure thing, dude. <laughs> but you it know, happened. it happened. If it wasn't for Dale, you know, he was the engine, though. Mm. You know, ideas. I'm not going to sit here and say it was my idea either, because people have been inter- no, it was interested, your idea. interested in lost speedways. No, dude, and it stuff. was your idea. I mean, it was but, all it was all over Facebook. You know, <laughs> I'm the it started off as pictures, and then it was a calendar that you <laughs> yeah, used to set. Remember the calendar? Yeah, I yeah. loved that. I thought it was. I think great. I gave you a free copy, right? I, I hope. think so. I yeah. don't know. You might yeah. not have, you cheap prick. <laughs> <laughs> But, it's gonna be a great combo, dude. <laughs> it's starting already. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but no, you—that was your idea. It, it really was. Thank you. But the fact that what you did though was that you started a fascination with people with these lost tracks. Because now I find myself scrolling past those lost speedway pages, going, "Okay, here's something that's new. Here's here's a track I've never seen or heard of." Chris Romano is great for posting an old photo oh, yeah. like that. I got to get him on the show. Chris well, is, you know where it came, you man. know where it came from though. So we both know where Lost Speedways came from. I slip. I mean, like I tease that it's like it was birthed from 1984. Yeah, because I, I can sit here and you probably can too, but I can sit here and I could literally tell you about going to the pit area after. Uh, uh, TK Tom Craft won the f- final race, the figure eight race mm-hmm. that night. And I can. And Bob Park. Yeah, Bob Park won the final modified race. And, and I, I can sit Payne there. Joey won Payne, the yes. Last TQ race. Yes. Yes. The Jersey A Jet, young Joey Payne. A young, jo- yeah, the Jersey <laughs> Jet himself, Joey Payne. And like, I could tell you every detail about that night, though. You know, I could tell you about uh, my dad talking to Bill Park in the pits or uh, Dick Trainer or. Um, I could tell you about my dad picking my brother and I up and putting us in the back of his uh, his his blue pickup truck. Uh-huh. And I remember, you know, this is back before safety. <laughs> I remember See, driving in the back of the pickup truck. I just remember being put in there and it was already late enough because we were in the pits for so long uh-huh. that the dew was on the tailgate. You know, and I just remember like it was cold and the dew 
and holding on to that tailgate and like seeing the speedway and then rounding the corner of the junkyard and seeing the lights and then not seeing them again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like the most scarring, you know, I went home that night and it's I like remember watching my, the ending shot of a movie. Yeah. But right? it was like, yeah. And I went home that night and I remember my mom, we were brush. I was brushing my teeth, getting ready. And I remember coming up to me and, holding her hands on my shoulder and saying, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I, w- I wasn't, mm. you know, I literally crawled into the bottom bunk of our little tiny, you know, bedroom. And I put the covers over my head and I cried, mm-hmm. you know, I was young and I just literally bawled, probably bawled myself to sleep, but bawled. Right. You know, and it's like so crazy to think that that many years later, something has such an impact on you as your first ever racetrack, you know, in the place your dad raced and, you know, seeing it close and being there the last night had such an emotional impact on your life that, you know, it still affects me to this day. And then, you know, to, to be kind of the inspiration for me, at least, you know, behind lost speedways is just proof how much it meant. And I know it's same with you. You know, we grew up there, man. We grew up there. We grew up Riverhead. You know, those places mean something. Yeah, I remember going to Freeport as a a kid. Uh, (laughs) I slipped my last race there was a lot of scattered memories because I was young back then Uh and uh, my family was having their own... uh, What family doesn't? (laughs) My family was having their own issues going on. So I think there was a lot of things going on back then because my dad and my mom were already separated. So for... Us in the early '80s, there was a lot of like childhood trauma tension. or yeah. tension. So, I I have scattered visions of it in in my head. I don't remember complete whole races from the last night, but I do remember Bob Park winning. Yeah. I remember Joey Payne uh, also like crossing the finish line and sitting in victory lane, but not it's cool much. That we've talked about we're talking about this because we've never talked about this. Yeah, I know. You know, and not it's much like therapy. Yeah, not much. I I'm, I have no memory of the figure eight race at oh, all. Yeah. No memory of Tommy Kraft winning. Of course, I know that he won from yeah. you know everyone talking about it. But I think that there was a lot of things that I had blocked out too as a little kid yeah. uh, because we were going through. My family was going through their issues. Yeah. You, you know, so we're, I didn't want to leave that night though. Yeah. Like that's a, why I remember everything about it because mm-hmm. I remember. I always had that in me, like when, when my grandparents, when my grandfather started having some failed health one time, I remember, oh man, are we ever going to have a Christmas at grandma and grandpa's again? You know, and then the next year we had Christmas there and everybody was healthy. And I just remember like there was a few years starting that year, I would take a step back in the scene of Christmas at our Dillner Christmas. And I'd take a step back and I'd just like look around and I'd like take it in and you know, listen to the conversations and the voices and the sights and the sounds and just kind of try to capture it in my brain. And I've always had that sense of nostalgia and love for memories and nostalgia and I'm mushy. And uh, I am too. that's why like the last night I slept, even, even though I was young, I did the same thing, you know? Yeah, uh, I mean, you you and I kind of both have, I guess, the same level of sentiment when it comes mm-hmm. to those kind of things, uh, you know, especially we don't deal with loss very well either. No. You know, I don't deal with loss very well. I lost my mom recently, yeah. you know, I know you lost your dad a few yeah. years ago, and... And, uh, and it'll never leave you. I don't think anybody really understands the gravity or the impact of losing a parent until you've lost one. No. You know, because it feels like your guide in life is gone. You know, that's what it felt like for me. Yeah. Yeah. I lost, I losing my dad. I lost everything. You know, that's the way I looked at it. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I still will sit there and talk about it to this day and cry, you know, and Uh, it's okay. There's nothing wrong about about mm -hmm. it. You know, it's just proof that you loved someone or something, you know, that, uh, you know, and, uh, my dad, you know, he raced at Islip, you know, and, uh, you know, your mom, all of our moms, anybody that's, 
Anybody that's even listening to this or watching this, mom like used your to mom, make loves fried you. chicken. We remember, remember, mom used to make fried chicken. We sit in the stands and, and bring it fried. to the racetrack. Yeah, because it was simple and easy. You know, <laughs> just it you wouldn't know. be soggy. So what's that? Would it be soggy? Ah, a little bit. Yeah. Nearly. She would always make it like I remember her usually making it fresh uh, before we would leave the house, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. and then put it in bags, <laughs> and, and then we would go to the track, and then we would eat, and uh, that's do what we would have for the night. Do you, you know? remember at Riverhead? In turn two, behind the grandstands, there was the beer stand. And there was this little stupid, like, it was like a hut, almost like a doghouse, like, height hut. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, I'd like to think that there was a door or some hinge or something. But do you ever remember, like, hanging out in there? No, with not, me? At, not at Riverhead. I don't remember I that. remember, like, I remember, distinctly remember one time, like, my parents would never really let me go off and play too much. Mm-hmm. And I remember this one time going down there. I think I told him I was going to go look at the photo stand or do, I don't know what I was doing. And I remember hanging out with you down there and just remember thinking like, oh, that's Derek. Hanging you know? out with the bad influence. Like, oh, that's Derek, man. This is cool. We're hanging out at the racetrack, you know. <laughs> God, so long ago. But, uh, oh, my God, it's it's been a while. And then from there, it was Long Island Trackside. And, yeah. you know, when you guys had started that, when you and Bob had started that that first year, I thought, wow, this was so cool. I'm like, <laughs> you know, our own local racetrack gets its own television show on News 12 Long Island. Yeah. You know, because for us at that time, Long Island is the world to you. You know, you've got yeah. beaches on one end, the city on the other. You've got uh, uh, a nightlife. You've got, you know, the, the South Shore. The North Shore has got the, the ports and, and, you know, the, the restaurants. Uh, you know, it, it it felt like the world to you. So yeah. for you to be able to get on News 12, you knew everyone on Long Island was <laughs> seeing you. That was the cool it part. It was cool, like, too, because it was like, you know, gr- I mean, I don't know if you experienced this, but like me, okay, growing up in high school, like grade school and high school and stuff, I really didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't have friends. You know, I had like one friend. Mm-hmm. And um, Mike Trillet. And um, all my friends were at the racetrack. So, and then you go to school and racing wasn't accepted. It was mm-hmm. stick and ball town. Right. So, like, I remember having, okay. and We, <laughs> were, the we were the weird we're ones the weird for liking yeah. racing. I know. Yeah. I got it, too. I, so, like, you would get bullied almost. Right. Like, I remember one time but uh, you know what's I, great? I had a Ziploc. Hold on. Like, okay. I, I had this Ziploc uh, the, in the Trapper Keeper that put you, remember that you put mm-hmm. your pencils in? Right. And I always had a picture of Charlie Drazombex, Willsburg number five modified in there. And... When Charlie died, it's not like I'm going to take it out of there. That's my hero, man. And um, I remember this kid named Mike. I won't mention his last name. Um, And this other guy, like, just completely relentlessly bullying and picking on me. And they were like, dude, you got a dead guy in your binder. You're weird. And just went on and on. I snapped. Mm. And I just punched him right in the eye, dotted his eye. You know, and it's like. I didn't have friends at, at, at school, but like racers were my heroes and people at the racetrack were my friends. My family was at the racetrack. And then later in life, growing up and going through high school and experienced a lot of like bad things in school and not wanting to even be there, uh, the racetrack was my escape. Uh-huh. You know, that, but that's where all my friends were. And to this day, it's, you know, pretty much reigns true. Like, Still, yeah. I don't really day. have many friends outside of the racetrack and outside of racing. Right. You know? I understand what you mean. I, I had similar stuff kind of happen to me, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I had some friends. You know, I, I did have friends in school. Um, but you know what is funny, though? Like, years later, um, they see you on Facebook and they go, man, I remember you were the only guy in school that liked racing. <laughs> and they do that to, to yeah. me, too, because, you know, in the middle of Ronkonkoma, Long Island, <laughs> which it, is the middle of Long which Island, which is exactly <laughs> right. It's the exact center of Long Island, Ronkonkoma, Long Island. I just love saying it. Ronkonkoma. Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm from Lake Ronkonkoma. <laughs> My name is Derek Pernasiglio. Hey, home a little bit. The Derek Pernasiglio show. <laughs> <laughs> Broadcast from Ron Conkoma. You need to have the leather coat with the, 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 the you know, popped what do you, what up you collar. Turn like, hey, the, you want to turn me into Andrew Dice You're Clay the Fonz, or something, right? <laughs> but, you know, if you come from that area, yeah. you liked, 
you know, the Knicks, the the Mets, the, the Jets, Islanders. the Come Islanders, on, yeah. the Yankees. All you know, you Isles. liked all, one yeah. of those things. If you liked racing, you were weird. It'd be you like know? racing. Like, what the hell is that? You were one of the rare ones. You yeah. you were, and and yeah, I was because I was the <laughs> I think the one of maybe one or two people in my school that liked racing, and and yeah. like you, I got made fun of about yeah. the racing shirts oh that I God. wore, and. I was upset Relentless. when Char- I was upset when Charlie died and, and when Richie died too, and I got made fun of for being upset and crying when a race car driver died. Yeah. So yeah, I remember that when I was younger. But yeah, um, people are dicks, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know it's like part of growing up. Like bullying is so much different these days because I look at it different now that I have a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want my kid being bullied, and there's there's definitely an awareness to it now. Because of mental health and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I went through damn hell in high school. I'm not going to lie. I, I weigh it to bullying now and what they consider bullying in school. Mm-hmm. And I went through, I mean, I remember getting jumped by multiple people at the same time, like gang jumped. Mm-hmm. You know, all this stuff. And trying well, to fight my way out big, of it. big, which didn't help, Yeah, too. I put a target on my back. Right, you so were also big. So I had to fight big. every day, right. you know, to prove myself. And it sucked. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's like, I didn't, I'm, you know, if you know me, I, I can be a... I can be a snap show. Mm-hmm. Well, you've seen, know, you've seen, seen that at the racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. That's not coming out. Yeah. Uh, but the like... cheeks get red. <laughs> the cheeks get red. The nose gets red. Oh, Charlotte yeah. Motor Speedway? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, like, you know, the stuff we went through back then, like, made us tougher, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, and... Uh, more resilient and we've needed it in our careers both of us well it's easier to, to, to be t- tougher when you were your size because remember me I was one yeah of but the you smallest, were always strong man I was always the smallest kid but you were in my strong. school and I got my I I got my my ass kicked so many <laughs> times I mean dude look at me now I'm 5'7 150 pounds you know I ain't, I'm not kicking anybody's I'm double ass. you bro uh, <laughs> are, you, are you really double shut me shut up oh okay next question <laughs> interview over <laughs> Too many stops at Rosario's. So, oh, yeah. Never so, too many. Yeah, I know. So, anyway, besides yeah. that, though, I mean, I know what you've been up to lately with, yeah. you know, the Dale Jr. download, which I got to tell you, the I'm so proud of you with that Thank show, you. too, because... You, Coming you, from you, that means a lot, because we grew up together, so... Well, you're, you're doing... You have turned that into... You have turned that into the Stern Show of racing podcasts. You you, you got to really it, it is on like that level because mm-hmm. everyone wants to come on it. The guests that you have on have been fantastic. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call you Baba Booey, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, you do you do hold that producer role, you. With, with, but you do it well. And I always used to remember when we we talked, you were kind of like the accidental talent. Because, you know, years ago, you said you didn't want to be talent or on no. air or anything. You wanted to produce features and documentaries yep. and, and create stuff. And it was never really about being a talent, but somehow you have morphed into becoming a talent. Well, it was accidental even being a producer. Like, I started as producing. Then when I got into shooting, I, I guess, and I don't mean this cocky, but I guess I did it so well that everybody wanted me to be a shooter. You and I remember going to a company head, that's all I'll say. And I had an opportunity for my first time to work at the network. They wanted me to just shoot. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know if I want to do that, man. I'm more, I want to do producing. So I went into that network head, that company head. And I remember saying, hey, I'm being offered this amount of money for 20 races. It's well more than, than here. I'll stay for no raise if you promise me, if you tell me there's a path within the next few years to maybe do camera less and do more producing. And that guy looked me right in the eye and all he said was one word. He said, no. And it was a gut punch, man. Like I left that day with negative three confidence in my life knowing, and then I took the gig the gig, the, the gig, and it, and it, it's funny how all these things that kick you in the gut, like throughout my career, throughout your career, all these things that kick us in the gut, that in the moment you create devastation, whether it's financial, uh, mental, um, confidence, whatever it is, end up in the end being better. And 
I had, you know, just like you, I know your career. You've been, you've been crapped on a lot. And that's why you and I are, have some similarities, you know, cause I've been told I'll never do this and I'll never be that. And I'll never, <clears throat> I'm not saying people ever, nobody ever said, Hey, you'll never amount to anything, you know, like the old uh, TV commercials. But I remember being told no. And I remember being told, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll never do that either. And somehow I've been able to make it work, you know, and, um, you know, people that really have a passion and care about the sport they love, if they work hard enough and they keep at it, will eventually, you know, rise to the top, you know, and, and even if they don't get to the top, they'll create their niche. You know, well, you know, I I always call you when I have those moments, you know, and I, yeah, I talk. We've to had you some pizza over. Them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> who who were you talking to? At first, that one I talked to nobody. I internalized it, and that was the worst thing I could ever do. Mm-hmm. Um, I <laughs> with Turner, we de- me and a buddy of mine, Nick Duncan, developed a food franchise kind of thing. Well, I had the Speed Eats mm-hmm. app that followed food along the NASCAR road, and he was like, "Hey, man, let's do this like food franchise, video franchise." And I remember doing it. You know, we did it on our travel day. We weren't paid for it, nothing. We just did it on our own, and we developed the franchise. And then I uh, had a new kind of producerish guy come in the next year when it wasn't with Turner, and he was like, hey, man, we're not doing that this year, but, man, I got my eye. I think that franchise that you and that Nick developed was awesome, so we're going to package it uh, and sell it actively. And I knew the guy that packaged it, and he said it was like a resume reel of all of Nick and I's work. It was incredible. You know, and we really worked our hearts out on it. And he's, you know, was going to sell it. And when you, and he's told me, he says, when we sell it, it's you. And I told him, I barely knew him. I'm like, hey, thank you. You know, thank you. Because you know, that's all, you know, you're working for free pretty much doing stuff like that just because you're working for an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then a uh, year or so goes by. I'm not hearing back from this guy. And I'm wondering, man, it's a few weeks before Daytona. I hope they're not, I'm not losing my gig or, you know, shooting. And finally, one of my friends within the company calls me up. He's like, hey, man. I'm like, hey, what's going on? You know, I haven't heard anything. He's like, well, there's a reason you haven't heard anything. I'm like, why? They're, well, they're, uh, they sold the sponsor for it. And I'm like, oh, my God, yes. He said, uh, but you're not doing it. And they hired some, somebody else, and it's not their fault. They're, she's a wonderful person to do it and I was devastated and uh then a few days later I got a call saying you're gonna have to shoot it so they took your idea your concept your everything and then made you just the cameraman on it and then they told me yeah you have to shoot this franchise okay what a kick in the balls and it was uh, it was tough you know I'm not gonna lie to you I I cried I'm not afraid to admit it uh I went on the first shoot with her and I didn't do the job I normally do. I shot it well. I didn't help her. Mm-hmm. And I went back to the hotel that night and I was emotional and I realized I did what I should never, I'll never do that again. I went back the next time I shot with her and I showed up as a professional because it was not her fault. Mm-hmm. She did nothing to me. It was a decision, you know? So I helped her out as much as I could. And still to this day, I've got a lot of respect for her. And uh, I, I had people in the industry, you know, that I lean on, one or two people, you know, tell me you should have told them to beep off, you know, the the, the company. I'm like, I couldn't. You know I would have. You know why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, I, I have a hard yeah, I'll give you I had credit. a kid. I, I had a kid, a man. I time separating that stuff. I, I know. I had one kid. I and, like, at that point, and I'm like – this is how I feed my family, mm-hmm. you know, so I got to take it, you know, and it was uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but I had to take it. And then it taught me something, though. It taught me how to be a professional. You know, it taught me how to deal with, you know, it brings you back to some of those moments growing up, but it taught you how to get through it and endure. And uh, and because of that, you know, you still have great relationships, you know, in, in the deal. And, and uh, it was the same guy that ended up uh, canning me like the end of that year. Yeah. 
and uh, and didn't have the chutzpah, I'll just say, to, to do it himself, had somebody else do it. But uh, it's funny because it's like that sucked too. I was two days away from having my second kid when they let me go. I remember this. Okay. And, um, this. and it was the, the most traumatic time in my life. People like uh, Rutledge Wood reached out. You know, it was always like, hey, man, if you need anything, you know, there's people in this industry that care about human beings that you'll never know. The people on TV will never know how good of people they are, humans. But um, if it wasn't for him letting me go, I never would have gotten a call from Mike Davis. I never would have gotten a call from Dale Earnhardt Jr. And they saved my career. They resurrected me. They resurrected my career. When I was sitting there in a hospital having a panic attack, wondering how I'm going to feed my family in a month when the money runs out. Um, and what that guy did by letting me go was he gave me freedom. And he gave, he gave me the best opportunity I ever got in my career, inadvertently. And you know the coolest part is, and I've never said this and. I don't, I, I love your podcast and what I love about it is people tell real stories on here. So I'm telling this for the first time outside of my family. I saw that same guy this year. And in the past, there's been times where I've seen this guy and I've wanted to, uh, not be a good person. I saw that guy this year in the garage at Daytona and I walked up to him and I gave him a big hug and I thanked him. And I forgave him. And there was such freedom and power in forgiveness. And you always hear it, man. You hear it in people's testimonies and stories and life stories all the time. And it's true. Because it was like, I finally just was like, you know what? I've been harboring this ill feeling for, you know, five years. It was a chip on my shoulder at first. It was like, I got to prove them wrong. You know, so when I started working with Dale and all, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was, I'm going. And I finally let it go. And it was like, dang, that felt good, <laughs> you know? And it's like, I hugged him. And I told him, thank you. And it was awesome, you know? What did he say? He was kind of a little nervous at first. <laughs> he was a little stuttery. I am a big guy, so if I come up and bear hug you, it's a little awkward to begin with. <laughs> yeah, right, I got but, you. Uh, but, yeah, he was cool, man. And uh, I, I f- genuinely forgave him yeah i mean well, that, so, what is it that's what they say i'm i'm not forgiving you for you i'm forgiving you for me yeah you, you know it's yeah it's that you know i wish i had that ability i really do but the old <laughs> we're Ita- northerners but man. the old italian and the old italian and me just you know we 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 hold on this we hold on to grudges and we hope yeah. for vendetta you know <laughs> that's, that's what it is you know you've got a heart though man and and you know you, you just got to learn how to it's okay to be emotional. You know, it's okay to have a heart. It's like me. I have a hard time talking about certain things, I'll be honest with you, without tearing up. I'm that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's cause I, but it's because I care, you know, because I got passion about what I do or humans, you know, like like friendships and family in my life, mm. you know, and, and, you know, if channeled the right way, that passion's a cool thing, man. My... My girlfriend has been really good in the sense that wait, wait, she's you're what? My my fiance. Thank sorry. you. Yeah. <laughs> she's gonna kick my ass about this. I'm working, I'm working for you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Mark. listen to him. He's a dumbass. Yeah, uh, uh, and you gotta come to the wedding. Matter of fact, oh I yeah, hope. we we need you. You're ordained, right? Yeah. All right, you gotta marry us. So, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm married. <laughs> yeah, you gotta marry us. <laughs> Aren't you supposed yeah. to propose to me? What's that? I proposed to my girlfriend weeks ago. Oh, oh, hey. you want me to like do the the actual wedding? You're not asking me to marry you. Well, you, you, know, you're, you, you know, the dude that says it's either going to be you or Andy Sice. So, you know, yeah. we got to flip a coin over who it's going to be. Because I mean, he's ordained, too. Is he ordained? Yeah, you didn't know that. Andy's ordained? He's married people. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. You didn't, dude. I, like, of all the things I've known. Well, two, okay, now that's two things. Like, I've, I've known Andy since he was like, first time I met him was wearing like Superman box uh, underwear at New Smyrna. I'm like, what the hell is that? And, and like, he was like a 50 year old kid getting dressed. I'm like, what the hell are you wearing Superman underwear for? Anyway, but like, I love the kid. He's like a, he's family, right. but it's like, I've never drank with him. Andy? 
Yeah, I've all these years him. I've hung oh, out with him. Oh, I've drank with him. I, I know have, you've drank I, with him. I've, I've heard. I puked him. Oh, my God. Oh, I puked my guts out of his house one night. So but that's, oh, they, that was all Shelly's fault, though. Shelly uh, was feeding uh, samurais. me. Samurais. Uh, I forgot right? what she was Samurais. Feeding. Well, I had just come Bobby from. Bobby size Samurais. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I, would just, I had just come from Rockingham from the K&N race, of all things. Okay. And, the race that actually uh, Corey had lost the championship at. Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. we had we had uh, Randy in here the other day, and he was talking about. Oh, he was he's still bitter about it too. It was, <laughs> it was great to see this, the expression on his face. Did you ask Randy about but, Buckshot. Uh, uh, we we did. Yeah, we talked to him. Well, our <laughs> he thing still was still that. Right, I know. But, but you know what though? Our thing is is we don't want to rehash what you guys have done in the download. I don't know if you know this. What's that? There's just a slight difference between you and. Uh, that skinny pale kid that I work for. Yeah, you, you guys Jr. have a shitload of budget, <laughs> <laughs> and he's just a little different than you. Just, a, just, 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 just a, a little just, bit. Just yeah. a skosh. Yeah, just a skosh. Yeah, uh, he's only only the most popular star in auto racing. So yeah, that that helps a little bit. <laughs> but <clears throat> other than that, yeah. You are making new moves now, though. Yeah. Uh, tell us about what some of the new moves are because uh, they were announced yesterday, weren't they? Yeah, uh, Dale. Dale, uh, Dale and Mike wanted to, to get it out there on the podcast yesterday, and uh, it was definitely a tough tough day yesterday to put together the podcast. And, you know, I'm moving on from Dirty Mo Media. Uh, I've got a lot of heart in that place. I'm not going to lie to you. I know. Um, you know, like I told you when I got let go, Mike, and I, I'm not afraid to tell people that story because I want people to know the brand of individual that Dale Earnhardt Jr. is, but also like even like Kelly – and some of the people in that family. And it's like, I'm not, a, I don't want to point the point it on me. I want to point it at them. Cause it's like, that's why I've got so much heart in that place. Because, uh, you know, when I got let go, they're the first people to reach out and give me an opportunity to feed my family. And I took that very seriously. And I took that loyalty very seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, I got offers, um, to leave and throughout my tenure there, four and a half years, I didn't do it simply on, principle of of loyalty you know um you know you you're part of a sports team right you uh you stick up for your teammates you drop the gloves for your teammates right you know uh you're part of a race team somebody messes with your guy you're the first one on Mm -hmm. it's the same thing you know um moving on is tough you know because i love them and i love the show i mean the show moves the needle you know, oh in God, the sport, it's moving it moves, the needle. Yeah. Like I just checked on the way here, and we were like top five in sports podcasts. Really good for you. And it's dude. within twenty four hours that episode's in the top five, and it's like how? Like like no other motorsports podcast is even sniffing that. Yeah, you know. So it's like Dale's brand above just being a racer is still so relevant and so powerful that it's it's tough to. I'm not gonna lie, it's tough to leave that. What is the number one sports podcast right now? Um, part of my t- part of my take, I believe, was number one this week. Mm-hmm. But you know the the charts fluctuate and stuff. But to be mm-hmm. in that conversation, it's huge. It's it, and it's tough to leave that. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna lie. But you know, this decision was a family decision. It was a decision to better my family, and I'm moving on to Flow Sports, mm-hmm. and uh, the folks at Flow have. You really wanted me over there and have made me feel very valued. And um, I've learned that there's a lot of real racers there, you know, from Rigsby and, you know, uh, uh, Bar- uh, Barnett, you know, uh, uh, Tyler. Uh, there's a lot of good people there. So I'm excited because I'm a big Flow fan. Mm-hmm. So is Dale, actually. Uh, I think all of us are, you know, but I'm a fan of all the streaming platforms. Mm-hmm. Though you know, like I don't even care. Like Tony Stevens does a good job with the cars races. To, 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 to you know, uh, Dirt Vision with the World of Outlaws. You know, yeah. There's a lot. There's it's a great time to be alive, right? Like think about this. Like I, I sat in my house with my kid a few weeks ago. And we're watching Stafford Motor Speedway where I grew up on Friday nights. Driving three and a half hours from Long Island to go there every Friday night. Mm-hmm. I'm watching on TV. On my TV. On my TV. Right. It's coming to, into your home. How amazing is life that we get a chance to do that? Like all the, the people that moan and groan on the internet, these keyboard jockeys, you know, it's like, shut up, man. We just got 
life is so good right now with stuff like that. It's like, okay, things may not, you may not be happy doing this, or you may not be happy doing that. Dude, sit back and realize there's some amazing things happening in this sport right now. People are just so quick to crap on our sport. And it's like, dude, we're living in a crazy cool time. It's besides like a the streaming, revolution. Besides the streaming, what do you think is some of the more amazing <clears throat> things that are going on? In the sport? Yeah. One, one, one person, to me, has uh, helped change it. It's Kyle Larson. Mm-hmm. Kyle hit the bottom, and when he did, he went on this tour of short track racing that did something for the sport the sport didn't realize was being done. When we lost Winston as a sponsor in our sport, it didn't just hurt the Cup Series. You know this. When we grew up, I'd have a Winston Racing Series patch. That's a little kit. Right. That had nothing to do with cigarettes, <laughs> right. dude. I didn't even know there were cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't know there were cigarettes. When we saw Winston, we thought race cars. It's racing. Right. So there was the connectivity that bridged the grassroots of the sport to the upper rank. And when you saw that affiliation of branding, you felt like you were part of the sport from top to bottom. I didn't care if you were running a mini stock. You know, I don't care if you're running a blunderbust. You know, you felt like you were part of the Winston Racing Series. You're part of the same kind of club, man. You're part of the, you're part of NASCAR. Right. And um, we haven't had that. And Kyle Larson, not a sponsor, not a brand. Kyle Larson went out barnstorming America at these little fairgrounds tracks, much like people did in the 40s and 50s. Right. You know, or, you know, the early days of racing Barney Oldfield, you know, barnstorming these fairgrounds tracks. He the just, out, he just, law guys that would travel for he, the money and he just did it in the, in, in the 21st century here. Mm-hmm. And, and, and won some big races along the yeah, way too. But like he literally connected the grassroots people and made them interested in cup again. And then cup guys, cup fans that may Maybe not be some of them, maybe hardcore racing fans. I'll just say, made them interested in turning on a Lucas Oil dirt late model race or, or or a, a Tony Stewart's you know All Star Circuit of Champions. They never would have watched that. Now they're fans. Yeah, Priest is kind of doing that too, though. With you know, in the run, asphalt world, or a little bit in the yeah. asphalt world, going back running a modified or yep. running a late model somewhere, and, yep. and so he is kind of doing that uh, as well. So is Bell. Yeah, uh, Reddick's been up to just him. not the impact, because right. if you look at the schedule, that the difference is well, the schedule and home. the versatility of the schedule. He didn't just go like Priest. Yeah, he ran a late model race or two, and you know. And you can look at Byron. He's coming from Cup and winning late model races. That is all great for the sport. Mm-hmm. But what Kyle Larson did as a generational talent, potentially potentially of the talent of one of the all-time greats. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, what, he is showing that he's, he's one showing of the He's showing that he will be all, one of the all-time right. greats. He'll be in the same – they're going to talk – I call him the baby goat. Yeah. They'll because he's going to be a goat in the same breath as Foyt or Stewart yep. or Parnelli or you know even the modern or, day guys like Tony Stewart you know, you know people like that right. you know I said Stewart yeah so, yeah I didn't hear you I'm deaf uh, yeah. I've been what? around race cars my whole life what 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 no I had nothing <laughs> <laughs> moving on to flow yeah. though what's what's the goal what's the uh, the thing that you want to do over there well uh, I'm gonna you know my role is relatively new mm-hmm. so I'm gonna be we're working with some feature films and docs and um. You know, I just want to uh, flow. Flow has become successful in sports, not just racing. Right. Uh, they have a lot of alt sports, as I'd like to call it, I guess. You know, like I love the fact that they have like some of the hockey stuff they have. I'm a big hockey fan. Right. Like I've looked through it and seen wrestling on yeah, there. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, high school sports to, to college stuff, like mm-hmm. to, to tennis, you know, amateur seen. type competition. Like they've hit the home run with racing. Because it's a good pla- it was a great platform, and now you're putting racing onto it. And my goal there is to be to just elevate that. 
you know, and elevate it through creativity, not, not the live events. I'm probably not going to be working much with live events, but I want to go over there and be a storyteller. I want to go over there and work on things from, you know, features and documentaries, uh, things of historical relevance, uh, things that just lift up our, I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to work to lift up the sport. And when you work to lift up the sport, inherently you will lift up the network if you put forth quality content, Mm -hmm. you know? Don't you get the biggest kick out of when you've made a feature that you know that is for that niche of short track racers and they just eat it up, you know, like, like it's junk food or that they just love it. Doesn't that lost Speedway like season two Pennsburg in the world? Who would have thought we'd ever produce a television show on a national level at Pennsboro Speedway mm-hmm. and tell the story of Jim Dunn that I remember telling the story to somebody and they just, it went right over their head. And then I remember presenting it to them. Mike Davis. Sorry, Mike. First time it went over your head. I love you, brother. But then he actually really read it. And he was like, oh, my God. My God, this is a this is incredible. This underdog story of all time. Mm -hmm. And we love producing stuff about short tracks. Who the hell would ever thought there'd be a TV show about Pennsboro Speedway? This little track in the nestled in the mountains the hillbilliest of all hillbilly tracks of all time. Yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, no, believe me. And, and, and it's, we, we want people to see what we're, we're making. Don't we? Yeah, we, we do. We want people to see what we're making. And that's the biggest thing. I want that, people. You know. It's more for me of not wanting to people to see what I'm making. It's more. I want people to see what's cool about our sport. I right. want to see, you know, this badassery that happened, but I want people to know that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not what I'm making. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm done with that. I don't care. It's, I want us, I want people to see the sport way, the way I see it. You know, I want us, people to think, realize how cool and badass you're looking at that wall behind you, the history of this sport is. And we can do that. Yeah. There's aspects of the sport now that they're producing everything from a, from a building in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Right. So the industry changes, and it's always going to change. It's just just like when we went to HGG, uh, HGTV. People were like, oh, man, I'm not going to switch to that, you know, whatever. Just like when satellite TV first came in. Every, now it's streaming. Content game constantly evolves and changes, and if you don't change with it, you're a dinosaur. You know, and I've learned that even through social media. You know, I mean, are we still on MySpace? Are you still friends with Tom on MySpace? <laughs> Tom you know? sold hey, me a whole Tom, man. He, he sold me a whole bunch of money. Oh no, man. Yeah. So like, you know, stuff comes Did up. He sell for like five or six hundred million I don't or something know. like that. I would take my that. MySpace is probably still out there somewhere. I could definitely Oof. deal with a cool five hundred million. That'd yeah, I mean that great. wouldn't be bad. You'd never hear from you. You know what though? Like, here's a, here's a fun thing. <laughs> well, here's some advice for you in your life. Okay. Because I'm gonna since this isn't an uh, interview, you, you're not interviewing me. I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> interviewing you here. <laughs> Remember, I'm more used to interviewing people, not getting interviewed. So this is this goes right along with it. I years ago in my late 20s, yeah. I created a bucket list, and I think everybody should create a bucket list, not when they're dying. Mm-hmm. Everybody creates a bucket list when they're dying. You don't have time left. What the hell are you doing? Yeah, create sure. a bucket list now. And on my bucket list, I have these green checks. Let me see what's I, on oh here. Oh boy, green, this is gonna be a green <laughs> check. Uh. Yeah, you can see it. Why not? Uh, I trust you. But like the green see. checks mean I've done them. Finally kiss a girl. <laughs> uh, My wife. Eat Erica. Mexican and not go to the bathroom 10 minutes later. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> no, but, but seriously, like when you, instead of crossing them off, you put a green check, it gives you a sense of accomplishment. Right, right. You know, and then another thing to that is you said about the money. Create a little part on your phone that says lottery. Okay. That, that was mine, even though I don't play it enough. And put down what you would do. So many people always say, yeah, if I had a million dollars, if I had 12, if I won $12 million jackpot, this is what I would do. I would do this. I would do that. Mm -hmm. Bull crap. Are you really going to do it? Uh, Who knows? Make you a list and hold yourself to it. You know what I mean? If it happens, I mean, hell. But yeah, hold yourself to it. It's goals. It's setting goals and trying to achieve them. Just like a bucket list. 
I've got things on there from going to the Knoxville Nationals, which I've never done, um, you know, uh, racing a figure eight car, winning a race at Bowman Gray to, you know, things with my family, you know, um, taking my kids to the New York, New York Islanders new arena, <laughs> uh, whatever. What are you going to do the day Hudson comes home and says he wants to race? <laughs> no, the, <laughs> that just happened. Did he really? Yeah. He I, said he I, wants to race? I take him to races all the time, and he never wants to race. And I'm like, perfect. Like, I'll, I'll hook him up with If he wants to work in the sport, man, daddy's got you, dude. He's only six now. Right, but, right. But, yeah, you want to work on a car, man? Yeah, I know some avenues you could get, get in at a shop and work for nothing and work your way up, man. You know? And he said the other day, yeah, I want to race. And I'm like, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you're not, you're going to be like me. See, I didn't have enough money growing up. We didn't, dad, dad quit racing to put food on the table. Right. And I always respected that. I had a huge, that's one of the things like, even looking back, he's gone nine, nine years now. I respect so much about my father because he gave up the ultimate thing that he loved the most to feed his family. Mm. And I wish I could have raced growing up. I got an opportunity to because my brother, when he signed his first contract, you were around for all those years, man. I got a chance to race. I wasn't really good, but, you know, wasn't any good. But um, but I got to do it. But right. yeah, growing up, you, you you dream of it, but we didn't have the money to do it. So it's going to be the same thing with Huts, and it's going to be like, sorry, dude. You know, we don't have the money to do it, but if you want to be involved in racing, that that's – I'm not a media guy. I mean, you're you. Were you raised to be a media guy? No, no, no. It wasn't we were we media were racers? Guy. But it always fascinated me, like growing up. Too, yeah, you know, racing and television always fascinated me. You know, race cars did, and but then you were how a racer. Television was made. I didn't get into media to be freaking Walter Cronkite. Right. I didn't get in here to be, you know, a TV personality or a producer. Oh, I want to do that. I want to work in racing. I'm a racer. All I cared about was coming in the sport. You know, my brother and I both. All we cared about was coming to this sport and seeing if we could make a make a living in it and make an impact in it. You drove, mm-hmm. you raced, mm-hmm. you anna- you did all these things. You were a racer. I was a racer. So what's the next for you? You know, you're yeah. going to flow. And going to flow. You're yes. still going to live in North Carolina. Oh yeah, though, yeah. Right? Um, okay. I'm I'm not moving. Um, right. I'm I'm still announcing uh, uh, the flow broadcast uh, for NASCAR on. Um, uh, at Bowman Gray Stadium, mm-hmm. which that's a dream, dude. Because that's coming to you know an how end much, soon, right? Yeah, it's coming to end uh, in mid-August. Okay. So um, I'm a huge, you know that I'm a huge Bowman Gray guy. Mm-hmm. You know that's like my, that's like my eye slip of the South. It is. It, it's you know, definitely totally like that. different. Totally different. It's a, sometimes it's a circus, this and that, but it's <laughs> it's <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> but it's 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 got its own um, emotion and feel to it. It's a Wrigley Field of racing. And it's so special, and it has so much history and so much tradition. And you know me, I eat up that stuff. So, you, like, you know, what's funny is that uh, will someone will post a video of a fight or something like that. There's most recently two guys that were going at it in one yeah. of the s- stock car divisions that were yeah. out there, and everyone's all over Facebook going, "This is wrong. This <sighs> is there. You know, uh, you know, don't ever do this. Don't ever do jockeys." And, and all, and my reply is always the same. It's just a regular night at the stadium. Yep. That's I remember bringing is. my uh, in-laws. Like, this is a good one. You ready? Like, I know we should be telling, like, uh, you know, you should be interviewing me, but tough. Um, brought my in-laws to the stadium for the first time. National an- the Racer's Prayer, National Anthem, 17,000 people. They're like, wow, this is pretty cool. We're on the front row. Mini stock start. Guy gets turned, hits this, the infield like kind of great deal that they used to have, and he barrel rolls it like eight times. I mean, bad wreck. Guy gets out. He's fine. Crowd. Cheers. He uh, zips down his suit, lets it lets it kind of hang down. He's got no shirt on. He's walking back towards the field house, and everybody's cheering him, waving. He's waving. Well, he walks right up to the um, field that's red flagged and turn three and four. Nobody's thinking anything of it, and he walks right up to the car that dumped him really calmly. He didn't run. Undoes the window net, drops it down. He's talking to the guy. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> it just starts unloading. <laughs> so here's this shirtless guy <laughs> unloading. Now the cops are trying to drag him off of this guy. And he's like this. And I look over 
and there's my father-in-law from Kansas, small town Kansas. <laughs> and this is him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked over and I went, I elbowed him and I was like, welcome to Bowman Gray Stadium. That's it. This is, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's man. eighth wonder of the world in racing. It is. And it's got, it possesses so much charm and beauty and history and so many great things about our sport, but then also the fringe things about our sport. But all in all, it's because it's such an electrifying atmosphere that it creates a, a, a tension and a passion that no place can ever replicate. Ever. Right. Well, uh, it's a historic place. And um, another track that's actually coming back is North Wilkesboro. Yeah. And you kind of had excited. a little hand in that in, in a way with cleaning the place with Junior for yeah. the iRacing scan and then... Didn't that kind of like spark some stir? Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing about that. It's funny because some people have been giving Dale and I credit for that and Dirty Mo Media and people involved in that. And I'm careful about that. I'm just going to be honest. To give Dale or give me or give Dirty Mo or give anybody that was there that day credit for bringing back the place is false. To give credit to even... The people that had that whole bring back North Wilkesboro campaign. That's false. To give this group over here credit. That's false. Not one person, one entity, you know, one team, one organization, one personality, whatever. Nobody deserves the credit for that. That should be even even Marcus. Marcus is the key there. If anybody gets the credit, it should be him. Marcus Smith for, in my opinion, helping save kind of the legacy of his family in a way and doing a beautiful thing. I mean, he was out there that day, not for pictures. Right. He He's, was out there that day. He had mud on his face because it was raining and working. And I was impressed because I've been impressed by him for a long time. Mm-hmm. People don't realize they see a guy that's, you know, the heir to the throne. Yeah. Good looking guy. Yeah. Well, and I, they don't realize they don't realize who he is and how good of a person he is. But what, getting back to that, no, none of us deserve credit. People have come to me also and said Lost Speedways helped inspire that. You think so? And I say, no. I, 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 if that is true, nobody will ever be more happy. And I could go to my grave with that happiness and that joy. Because to have a, it's on my bucket list, have a part in bringing back Lost Speedway. If that's the case, I could I could put a green check there. I don't because it's bigger than that. You know, there's been people that have been busting their butts for years. Benny Parsons' wife is one of them to try to get that place back. Mm-hmm. Is it fair to them that we we take the credit or Dale takes the credit or this person or Harry and John and this guy over here takes the credit? No, it shouldn't be about credit. It should be about the point. Remember what I talked about, about history? You see the people that really are advocates for history and do things, but then they point it back to themselves. The people who do that about North Wilkesboro, they didn't bring it back. The people that care about it are not going to point it back to them. They're going to be constantly pointing at the racetrack, constantly pointing at its history, constantly pointing at where it's going next. Because they don't give a crap about, you know, right. they give a crap about the sport. What are, what are some of the things that are, uh, there's a lot of great things that are going on right now. But what are some of the things or areas that could use improvement? With? Just the, the, the general. The sport? The sport in general. Um, wow, that's a bold question. Um. Like, you know, because I think we need I think we need to like in the top levels, I think we haven't done a good enough job ever reconnecting with our core fan. Like we said, we were. We need to reconnect with the core fan, the core fan. We said Steve uh, Phelps came on our show Mm -hmm. and said he'll never ignore that core fan again. And they've done a good job. Not a great job. NASCAR's done a good job. NASCAR's doing a great job at attracting new fans. Being bold. Dude, they just raced at the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. 
Love it or hate it, who cares? They did something. They're going to do a street race. Love it or hate it with the street race. Mm -hmm. They're doing something badass and bold. Right. Give them some props. Stop whining. Stop your... It's this incessant whining of anti-NASCAR sentiment because they're the they're the big like corporation. I'm sick of it. They're trying. They're trying to move the needle. Mm-hmm. They're not just being complacent and repeating the same things that they've done. But at the same time, when they're doing that, they need to make sure they're keeping an eye on that core fan and keeping that connection going. And that, to me, means more short tracks. Well, and Dale's been talking about that for years. And we need to find a way to where NASCAR... I'm sorry, uh, uh, half, you know, uh, how many short tracks do we really have? You, you lost Bristol as a short track because you're putting dirt on it. Martinsville, two races. Bristol. Richmond. Richmond, to me, doesn't race like a short track. So what do you got? What do you got? Why can't the Xfinity Series run? Why do they have to? I know why, but why do they have to run with the Cup Series all the time? What happened to all those great standalones? Right. What happened to truck well, we series, all those great standalones? Yes, we were talking about that with Randy LaJoy yesterday yeah. about, you know, the different tracks they would go to. Rougemont, Hickory, you know, Nashville, you know, Nashville, Nashville. SRX uh, just raced at Stafford. So, yeah, no, I know. And it was, a, it was incredible. Mm-hmm. It was incredible. It was a spectacle. Yeah, it, it was a, a fun show to watch. Um, the, the other thing, too, though, is that you are also dealing with one of the hardest customer bases to satisfy. Because you're one. You, you, you really are. Because <laughs> it, I started working at Mountain Creek Speedway doing PR for the yes. track. And when you are on that other side of the tracks or that other side of the fence, then you are, uh, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the, you, you step into the complaint department where yeah. everybody comes and they just come and they just puke their complaint right into your garbage can. You, you know, and uh, it sucks. I've never been on that receiving end of it before because it's always been, you know, doing television, doing, you know, what it is to lift the sport up. This is lifting the sport up, but it's in a it's a, it's an area that has a complaint department. Yep. And man, you try so hard, but ma- not everybody's going to be happy. Th- you none, you're never going to make them all happy. No. That's the one but thing you, I but learned. But you can't completely you ignore can't, people you have to listen to them even right. if you don't agree with them i mean you do nine time <clears throat> you do nine out of ten things right they'll harp on that tenth thing yep. which is frustrating as all get out i, I will yeah and, and you know me with my temperament we don't know no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah so I, if, do you have a temper dude i have to bite my tongue on social media trying to deal with some of the people that write into the track. You have oh a temper? My God, I guess. I'm so glad I've never had a temper in my <laughs> I life. I know Adam Stewart is listening or watching this right now and just laughing because, you know, he's the track owner at, yeah. at Mountain Creek. So I'll call him all the time about, you, you don't know, curse, do you? What's that? You never curse or anything. Never. Never. No, never, 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 never no. no, no, no. I never do that. <laughs> Us Long Islanders never have tempers around racetracks oh, at all. Ever. I, I will get Adam on the phone. Did you see what this asshole wrote? You know, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, but it's a huge difference being on that other side of the fence because you are trying to make them happy and and you trying to wonder if it's if you're ever going to make them happy and what it is that you can do that they are going to like because you try to do something sometimes and they're like you just get torn apart on social media or or, uh, when you have the event, you know, from parents coming up to you. So being at the 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 fact of the or the point that I'm trying to make is is that it is the hardest customer base ever in I think in all of sports to please. But guess what? Your customer base is is you. And if you keep that in mind, you're hey you complain, yeah. don't you? Oh yeah, I know. I'm guilty of it. I am. I mean, really, I'm. I can point the finger at myself at enough things. Trust that, me, the internet pisses me off every day. Ugh. <laughs> Twitter pisses me off every day, but guess what? They're still, yeah, you know, Johnny Cash saying these are my people. Yeah, for good or bad. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I I know, and I get that whole frustration thing scrolling through social media about racing and all of that. You just want people to get happy, and you you want to make uh, you want to make a good show. I call you know? them out. 
when when they're grumpy for no damn. There reason. are some that I'll call I'll out. I'll call them out. Yeah, there are some that I'll call out. We had a rain out a couple of weeks ago, and one guy was bitching and complaining, and I was just like, "Listen, this is the chance you take. Sometimes it it rains out, and sometimes it doesn't." You, you know, I thought you, you I thought you controlled the clouds. What's that? I thought you controlled the uh, the clouds. I I got God on speed dial, so yeah, I, I've got an iCloud. Technically, cloud. I don't control it, so I just put yeah, in a call. Yeah. You know, but you know, hey, what can you do? But yeah, that it's hard being in in that world. Yeah. So you need to come out on a Sunday and check it out. I need to. Yeah, definitely. You I need to. I want to bring out. Hudson. It, dude. It is like I've been slightly busy lately. It, it, put it on your bucket list. Just a skosh. <laughs> put it on Just your a skosh. Put a, go, there you go. Go to Mountain Creek. Put you put Mountain Creek Speedway on your bucket I'm list. I'm doing it right now. That way you can have a good check. <laughs> I'm doing it right under Mountain Creek. Hold Mountain on. Mountain Creek. Visit Mountain Creek with Hudson. It's got to be with Hudson. Yeah. It's a neat little play. You got to drive through a uh, cow It's right pasture. in between um, see a movie at a drive-in. You've never seen a movie at a drive-in? No. Really? No. Oh, my God, I didn't dude. do a lot of things in life. Dude, there were drive on Long Island. Yeah, but all we did as a family was like, I'm telling you, dude, I worked with my dad. My brother and I worked with my dad on roofs and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. we went to school. Then on Fridays, we would get, try to get done with the work early. We'd drive three and a half hours to Stafford. And either we'd come back to go to a racetrack on Long Island, or we'd stay up in New England and hit, like, Riverside Park, then Thompson. Whatever. That's all we did was race. Really? So, like... I saw Empire Strikes Back in the drive-in. Really? Yeah. I never saw a movie until Ghostbusters. I was like so old the first time I went to a, a movie theater. It was like kind of pathetic. I didn't even know. I was like, wow, this is what a movie theater is like? Were you that sheltered? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sheltered. Like, I saw Ghostbusters in the theater too, though. <laughs> but like, it was like, I, was, again, I, I would say, yeah, I was sheltered, but I was, I'll never, I'll never give it up for anything because like nobody was closer with their brother and their mom and their dad because all we did was travel to races together and and stay in the hotel or or in the back of my okay this is cool dad had the uh, 1987 red and white Ford pickup truck cab and a half we thought we were big time with the cab and a half man and we had a cap you know the caps mm-hmm. on the back yeah matching the two tone. And my dad built, uh, he always put a rug back there and he cut it with the wheel wells. And we put pillows and blankets back there. My brother and I, we'd have our boom box with our tapes all queued up. Right. And we'd go to races in that thing, just laying back there. You got pictures Like you wouldn't it? do that now. No, I wish I did. And it's <laughs> like, we thought we were like high living, dude. We thought we were like, you know, like how people would think they're driving in a, a Prevo now, mm-hmm. like, you know, a coach. Dude, we thought we were that. Like it was like, dude, we get this is this is high living right here, <laughs> you know. Sometimes we didn't have enough mo- money for a hotel, so we'd stay in that thing. Right. And my dad built like a little bunk that went across it. And I remember one time camping at Thompson Speedway, and it was so damn cold. But we had a we were all in there, but we woke up and the condensation formed like you know stalactites and stalagmites. Right. Mm-hmm. It formed these giant icicles that came down. <laughs> like so, I woke up and it was like, what the heck is that? You know, yeah, so I, that was our that was our life growing up, man. We grew up at racetracks and roughing it. Same thing with my old man. He had the slide in in the back of his truck. The, those the slide th- in. He had the cap on it. Yeah, and yeah. These, this thing that would call a slide in, and it would actually slide in, and it was like a bench. It was a bench on each side, uh-huh. and then there was the mount in the center for a table. Nice. And then what you did was is you slid a big long plank down the middle to take all the couch cushions and flatten them all out and make a bed. Make a bed, yeah. Right. So that's where we would sleep. And then the old man would pack the all the race car parts and everything else in the back end of the truck. You, you know, we had an uh, open trailer with a tire rack, and that's where we slept. We slept across the back of it going to races. You, you'd roll over. I need to do that with Hudson. You'd roll I need over. to go to, like, Dominion Speedway. Yeah. And instead of getting a hotel, I need to be like, hey, man, we're going to sleep in the back of the truck tonight. He'd be like, cool. He'd yeah, be like, yeah. <laughs> These kids, man, yeah, like a, we're going to a hotel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we you, we'd roll over in the middle of the night, and yeah, your 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 feet would hit the jack, you know, <laughs> you, you, hit, you hit your foot, and ow, you know. So, and I remember sitting, I had World Series morning, you know, in October with uh, the the my dad's F one fifty tailgate yeah, open. Those up are with, cold with mornings, the Coleman man. heat with the Coleman cooker going. He'd make bacon and eggs uh-huh. in the back of the truck, and that's where we would do it. But those uh, World Series mornings, I oh know. my god, they were cold. Getting back to the movies, what's the last movie you saw? Uh, good question. Um, was it a kids' movie with the kids? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> last time I was in a theater, <laughs> all that changed. Last time right? I was in a theater, I was in the theater when we were doing Lost Speedway season one, right before the pandemic hit. 
Um, and we saw a movie where it was like one camera for the whole entire movie. It was like a war movie. 1917. Yes. Yeah, great movie. There was a f- few times, like if you really study the movie, you could tell when the cuts were. Mm-hmm. But Still well done. Wonderful, wonderful film. Um, but yeah, I'm, besides that, I just like ingest history docs at home. Oh, me too. Um, you know, uh, sports documentaries yeah. and kid shows. When I can get when I can get Martin to turn off Dr. Phil, I like to put on documentaries, yeah. different ones. If I'm not watching live racing, she I'm watching Do- docs. She watches Dr. Phil all the time. Dr. Phil? Really, dude? I'm going to have to deal with that after we get married, too. Uh, no, you not, don't. It's, it's called, not. like, give her her own TV. Well, she's she's got one. You know. Well, but, yeah. yeah. And you have your own TV, right. and you stream races, and you watch docs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Getting, you don't have kids. I don't want to hear it. I, I know. I know. But okay. The, Your life remember, is so tough. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you, try you, managing. You have to manage a TV between yeah. another adult. Yeah. No, but have I, fun. I, try managing rental properties. That's, well, yeah. a, that's another yeah. issue. But, My life but, is not so, but, but it's try, not as easy as you try think. Ha, try, <laughs> try sitting there and wanting to watch a race so bad, but you're looking up and like yeah. Wally Kazam or whatever his name is, is playing and you're just like. Right. <laughs> I'm getting the high sign from Chris. He's like, hey, you got 15 minutes left. So, yeah. We <laughs> oh, got... we're going to do. Oh, I thought we were just hanging out. Are we going to do we an can, interview? I don't know. We can keep going. Uh, it, what What question we... do you have? Oh. Okay. We've known each other for how long? I know, right? How long? Uh, since our single digits. Yeah. Yeah. So, Remember if there's what... one question you've always wanted to ask me. Yeah. See, I mean, see, okay. I'm even interviewing you. You're interviewing you. me. Come on. Go ahead. What is it? Oh my God! And I know I'm probably gonna get critiqued like hell if I ask you this question. Yeah, <laughs> just do it. Rip the bandaid off. I might critique you or be pissed at you, but do it. I invited it. Right. Uh, I tell you what. You know what? Uh, <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna ask you something first. Okay. Uh, okay. Give you time you, to think. You've had no. You've had a lot of success in this sport and different Thank you. aspects of it. You're doing. Thank totally you. NASCAR race day over the years. Yeah, you know, man. Working with Pregano, working yeah. with you know, all dude, race day where we first, yeah, where we first yeah. started. I know. God, TNN. I know. What do you think is your your greatest or biggest accomplishment so far in the sport? Without a doubt, lost speedways. Yeah, I had there's a there's no there's nothing I've cared about more in the sport than that project and there's nothing that's had more of a deep personal impact I mean everything in my life like I said before about Isla everything in my life points back to Isla everything it wasn't around that long of my life everything points back to it the way I you know collect things the way I cherish things the way I look at family and moments and memories and the appreciation for history or nostalgia, everything comes from losing Iceland. Yeah. Everything. And I was so, the night that show, the, the night our show debuted, you know, we all worked pretty damn hard on it and had to finish season one during a pandemic from our homes producing a television show was in, it was literally the most insane thing I've ever been a part of. If people even knew what it took, they would not believe it. I believe it. You're a production guy. That's why the show was racing. You took racing and archeology span and somehow got them to mesh. It's, it was, I don't know how we got the show done. I mean, there was a few nights where we didn't go to bed and it was old school. It was bad. And, um, but I can't, I can't tell you what it was like to my, my family was away in Kansas and season one debuted. And when it hit Peacock and hit the TV, I was alone sitting in my recliner in my house and I was all alone. My family wasn't there to enjoy it with me. There was no like party, no friends, you know, it's the pandemic. And like all I could think of was uh, was all like all I could think of sitting there alone was Islip Speedway. Well, it, it also not the show, the big, not yeah, the show, also probably the biggest moment of your career and there's no one around to celebrate so it with you. Awkward. 
Yeah. So awkward. But it's also good for the, you know, probably for the ego. Like if I had this opportunity, okay, you knew me back in my partying 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. Um, If I had this opportunity back then, I don't know if I would have handled it well. You know, right. I was, I was wild, you know, I wasn't a bad person, but I was wild. Right. And you like to go party, party. And, you know, I had an ego, you know, and I had that ego knocked down a lot and, um, I'm not afraid to admit it now, but like having this kind of success, I guess, you know, um, what people would perceive as success, I guess. And, and having that show in my forties is so much different, you know? Like the perspective is different, you know? Uh, but yeah, sitting there that night, literally all I thought about was uh, last show forever. Pen right above it that said 1984 and pen. Uh, last show at a speedway we'll never forget. It was the ad that was in New York Newsday. All right. Mm-hmm. For That's literally what I, th- I sat there and thought of. Wow. While, while that first show was going on and I'm sitting there in a house by myself and like this supposed to be this grandiose moment of your life. And it was like, but that's how much it me- it meant to me. You know, Islip meant to me, even in the like most successful moment, probably in my career, I couldn't help but think, oh, racing, you know, really? you oh, and it's my tra- Kerman Jr. You forgot to try, but put, it's okay. Pick up the phone, pick, put him on speaker. But it's okay. <laughs> My my Kerman Jr. We're, uh, we are live on the Derek Printer Siglio show. <laughs> We're on the air. Sorry, I couldn't come on at the right time. Well, hey, would you like to say something real quick to Derek Printer Siglio? We're on the Michael? air, Mike. We're on the air. <laughs> We're on the air. Hey, DP, what's going on, man? I'm good, man. I'm I'm good. Good to hear. We from love you, me. Mike. Yeah. Let me guess, y'all talking racing. We are. Slightly, slightly. <laughs> my phone, I didn't turn my ringer off, but the funny thing is, it's a racing sound. And here's a racer and, calling. And I look on there, and there's a picture of you and me sitting by your modified, the number 15, at Bowman Gray Stadium, yep. and you're wearing my hat. That's awesome. That's for, pretty good. For well, those that are just listening in, Mike Herman Jr. has just called in, and Mike Herman is, I guess you could say, the spotter to the stars. He's still, yeah, who, man. who's he spotting for Chris now? Chris Busher these days, for but Busher. former Concord Speedway, Lost Speedway, yeah. uh, track champion. But Mike, hey, Star I love you. I'll call, I'll, call you uh, I'll call you right after this. Hey, man, appreciate it, brother. Y'all have fun. All right, love you, brother. See you, Mike. See you. There's a perfect that. example of like a good human being like that you meet in racing. I like, want to have him and his dad on the show. You should. I mean, uh, Pop Pop hasn't been doing great in health. And I know. We're we're, uh, we're we're I've got him in our daily prayers and Junior mm-hmm. Motorsports is praying for him. Well, he worked um, with uh, yeah, Robert he, G, didn't? He? Yeah, he worked with Robert G and Robert G Jr. He was one of the originals in the the Dale or early Dale Earnhardt Inc. days. You know, the the first company. You know, when Dale Earnhardt was running late model sportsman cars. Right. Um, when he so, had the, the, the number eight sportsman, yeah, right? Yep. Okay. And, and Dale, uh, I mean, um, Mike, Mike Herman's like one of my dearest friends and he's got such great perspective cause he was a race car driver. He's done it all. But you know, when my dad passed, when my dad was in the hospice, this is how good of a human he is. You know, we always tailgated, right? You've been to some of our tailgates. Have, we have fun, man. Wherever we go, we're going to have fun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was just in such a hole when dad was in hospice and, um, you know, we were going out and people were getting us food or I was going to pick up food and bring it back. And all I wanted to do for some reason was grill out. So I had my Dodge Dakota RT with the tonneau cover. The red one. Yeah, the red one. And, uh, I pulled my grill out of that thing and I went and got some burgers and dogs and I was like, I'm going to cook for the family. So I'm sitting there and I'm setting up my grill and, uh, the phone rings and it's Mike Herman Jr. And he's like, hey, MD, how you doing, man? How's everything going? Because he knew what I was going through. And I was like, not good, man. I'm like, I'm in a hole. He's like, what you doing? I'm like, man, I'm about to, believe it or not, I'm about to tailgate my dad's, I guess, not. Well, I don't want to say deathbed, but like tailgate my dad's hospice. It's just a weird moment, you know? And uh, 15 minutes later, old blue. His old little S10 truck pulls up right next to mine. And he's like, MD, he goes, you're going to tailgate here. You're not doing it alone, brother. That's cool. That's and, a good heart. And we're sitting there flipping burgers, and I was telling stories about dad. And it, it was like, that's just case in point that, like, racing friendships are real friendships. Yeah. 
you know, and here he was at the possibly one of the lowest parts of my life, you know, and he was right there, you know, flipping burgers with me, you know, I know, I know what you mean. Great person. They, they rally around you when, uh, when, when bad things happen. Yeah. They all piled in all like a race team. Like it was about, you you were that my dad's, uh, wake. And I remember dues and, you know, Johnny Denniston and some of the old gang and stuff, some of the partiers and the crazy people that I'm, I'm, I love and I'm friends with. And, you know, all these guys just showing up, they showed up like a team, you know, to come through the line, you know? Yep. I remember I I was there, (laughs) uh, you know, I mean. Hell, I mean, you, I used to sit with your dad yeah. years ago. You know, the, at the racetrack, yeah. The, the nights that it, my my father couldn't be there because he was racing the midget, and my brother was running the blunderbuss. You, you know, I chose to go with my brother out to the track. When yeah. your your old man, you always used to keep an eye on me, like he was, you know, my chaperone for the. He evening. loved you, so yeah, I, you know? I get it. You know, and then we moved down here. He was. He was very You live with me. I did. Oh, That's let's right. wait. Hold on a Dude, second. Remember what my we first day on the job was? Remember what my first day on the job was? Yeah. I remember you moved yeah. down here and I just found out maybe not even five minutes before that Dale Earnhardt passed away. Right. And I get a knock on the door. And it was you and your dad. You had tears running yeah. down your cheeks. That was one of the few days I wanted to quit the sport that next day or two. Because and it was same thing happened to me in New Hampshire, but different circumstances. But I got sent and I've never said this. I got sent to go just stand guard out, you know, stay outside of the house. I'm like, this isn't right. You know, they're in heart household with a camera. And I'm like, I'm standing out there and I remember just like, I was supposed to have it up, ready to go or whatever. And I remember just putting it away and like, I was there, but I really didn't, I didn't shoot anything. Those are the times when feeling like media makes like, you I feel I don't awkward. like it. Makes you feel dirty. It, it, I know. It's like, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Like, okay, Kenny Irwin. I got to know Kenny. Um, his rookie year, we went out in New York City, had some fun. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, what a great dude. And then throughout the course of the next few years, like got to know him and, I'd go talk to him in the garage or he got, he, he got mad at me one year cause I missed coming up and giving a fist bump before the race. I would go back if he was starting 26th and give him a fist bump. And, uh, I was there at Loudon that day he passed away and, uh, seeing, I was there, you know, when they pulled him out of the car and, um, uh, you know, we saw a lot of, you know, we saw a lot of death growing up, you know, yeah. in, uh, in our upbringing uh-huh. with modifieds and more. Midgets and midgets and um, cars. That day rocked me, and uh, rocked me. And I remember the next morning waking up and I saw the newspaper the next day that had that awful picture uh, that never should have made print on the front of it, and that was my friend. And well, uh, the car upside down? You mean? No, it was just a bad picture. Oh, all right. And um, I don't even like. Yeah, it was a bad picture. Mm-hmm should be ashamed of themselves for putting it on there. Mm. And I remember calling my dad and saying, I don't, I don't ever want to work in the media again. I don't give a flying crap about the media. I'm done. Mm. And I was young. So I was being dramatic, you know, probably being a little dramatic, but I didn't care. You know, that was a friend, you know, you know, these people, you got to realize these humans, you know, people will say, you know, being, I'm blessed to be, to have spent a few years now on the inside of the, the, of JRM and the, the Earnhardt family Mm -hmm. and getting, gotten to know them and what brand of human beings they are. And, uh, it's always funny to me when people tell them like, Oh, you don't understand. I was so sad that day and I cried and this and that. And it's like, that was their, that was their dad. Mm -hmm. You know, that was their brother or, you know, and, and you, you think it was tough for you or you or you, like, try being them. They yeah. lost their everything. I lost my everything when I lost my dad. You know, that's that's tough. You know, and just like that day with Kenny, you know, I was ready to quit. I was ready to be done with media forever. I hate, I, I literally hated, and I don't use that term very often. I had such disdain for media for a while after that. 
Yeah, I, I, and, and, and it's understandable because there's times where we got to do things that we don't want to do. Yeah, it's um, awful. When Teddy died, uh, Ted Christopher was killed. Yeah. We still raced that night at Riverhead. Yeah. And I had to deliver the, the news about it in the oh. open. You know, I had to deliver the op- the news about yeah. it in the opening segment of the show. And that's oh tough. My, oh, my God. I, we must have did like 15, 16 takes because I'd have to wipe my eyes or just I couldn't get it. You know, because just the impact of it, yeah. you know, realizing it. Because Teddy and I had just talked and cut up like the week before we were at a track and you know you know how Teddy is yeah. And, yeah. you know we were at a track we were at a track that was a momentum track and you know Teddy's sitting on the, on the wall and he's like oh, I don't like this fucking track uh, like what's a, what's the matter Teddy I, I don't like this you got you got a back pedal and all that I don't want to track you ride around I want to track you race around you know just you know that that kind of stuff so we had just cut up about that the week before yeah. and um then the you know the next week we were waiting for him to show up at the track and you know he didn't show up he didn't show up and then we just kept getting yeah. word and word and word and finally we got the confirmation and everyone I remember was like walking around not it was just in disbelief like this a trance like, probably right it really what it was like a trance because I mean you know you think of Teddy you think tough hard as nails you know you know short track racer he's been in a bunch of wrecks and yeah it's uh the only thing he did on his tippy toes was walk (laughs) because he had the damn heaviest right foot holy crap he was great (laughs) he was a gas you know sprint car racers call people like a gasser you know how lucky that also he was a gasser i think about though how lucky are we though because we are still alive in an era where we got to see guys like you know Charlie J, John, Johnny Coy, yes. uh, you know uh, Johnny Men, the Fenoros race, uh, yep. uh, you know sprint car guys, Steve and Sammy, uh, you know Mario Andretti yep. before he hung it up. Like we are, we probably wow, there. are m- way more lucky. I guess if there is, if, if that's the correct English to use, way more lucky. We're, we're luckier. <laughs> we're luckier. We're than, much more luckier. Right than a lot of the guys that are out there, and and. I think it's I think it's fortunate that you and I have had this time together and been able to do what we've done. Yeah, buddy. So um, I'm glad that uh, I got to interview you tonight. <laughs> and I'm you glad you that wanna... I got that pizza. You promised me pizza. Sorry, we'll have to we'll get it on the way out of here. What type of person are you? We'll, you we'll promise get... a guy a pizza. You show up. I'm hungry doing this interview. I'm my stomach's growling. There's no pizza. If I could reach across the table right now, I'd give you a big hug, man. I love well, you. Well, when the uh, cameras are off, you can give me a big hug. I know you don't. You're not the big mush like I am. Uh, he's, I mean, you'd be surprised lately. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, I love you. I'm brother. a hugger. Uh, you know. So I know don't, you don't are. worry. I know you are. But when uh, you're this big, you got to be a hugger, buddy. Thank you for coming on the show today. Hey, man. Thanks I really for having appreciate me. It. I thought there was like 10 things on my list that I thought you were going to ask me about. And I'm so glad you didn't like what I'm not going to say. Oh, come on. Cause nope. you, you said, well, you said, you know, I, I want you to be real with me when we sit down and we talk and <laughs> yeah, I, like I don't think- want this like formal interview. Hey. Right. I didn't want it what to was be the first time. You, you know? I didn't want it to be verbal ping pong where no, I ask man. a question, you answer. I, I just want to hang out. I just want to chat. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so glad. That for, it went this way. <laughs> good. Well, maybe next time I'll think of those whatever yeah, 10 questions don't. it was that yeah, you wanted me to ask. But <laughs> thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Love, Love you, brother. You. Matt Dillner from the Dale Jr. Who? Download. Matthew. And, Matthew. What? You're Matt to me. Oh, you know, yeah, you are from Long Island. You'll always be mad yeah, to me. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's hard hey. for me to call you Matthew. So, hey. yeah, come on. Let me wrap up DP. the show right now. Oh, you're going to end the show? They're screaming in my ear right? So to wrap it up. we got people that got to go home, too. You know? hey, this is the Derek Pernasiglio Show's interview with Derek Pernasiglio. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Dillner joins us on the Derek Pernasiglio show. That's right. I said Matt Dillner. <laughs> <laughs> from the Dale Jr. Download and from Lost Speedways. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you the next time. Bye. <laughs>